Um, so as I promised, my presentation is going to be a little bit different. Um, I don't really have a disclaimer other than I'm a goldfish and a very short-term memory, so I forget stuff in five minutes, so you can't hold me to anything that I say. Um, so I, I, you know, sort of, um, I was going to talk just about stuff, really. Um, uh, the big question for me is, is with this Auckland housing market, you know, is the market overvalued? Um, are house prices too high? Um, you know, are property prices going to crash? You know, this week's been kind of interesting watching the share market uh, in terms of, you know, everyone starting to talk, you know, some sort of correction and will that lead to a recession in the US and then will that sort of end up going around the world? So these big philosophical questions, I've been sort of sitting there trying to figure out. And of course, I'm just a humble mortgage broker, so... Um, what I know a little bit about is debt. Um, but I want to start with something a little bit different. Can anyone tell me what that is? It's an IBM PC, right? What's the year? 83, 1983. 128K RAM with a dual floppy disk. You know, kids these days wouldn't even know what, a, what a, one of those big, I think it was five inch or whatever it was, those big floppies. Cripes. Um, my school, we had 700 kids in my school, and I remember we got two of these loaned to us from IBM. We couldn't afford them. The school couldn't afford them, so they loaned them to us. I was a computer monitor. And then back in those days, just a bit of a geek, back in those days, it was DOS-based and, and, you know, it was simple things like getting the, the computer to say hello back to you. You know, it was just, it was just like mind-blowing stuff. Okay, so, so that was 1983. When do you think that was? <laughs> Come on. 1995. Um, so Windows 95, that was really the first version of the proper Windows. That's when they brought DOS and Windows together, uh, and, and, and that's when Microsoft really sort of started to explode. So we sort of had that first DOS-based PC in 83. By 95, you know, we had a, like a proper functioning Windows environment. So that was, uh, what was that? It was 12 years. Jump forward to, what's that? It's an iPhone 1. Does anyone know what year it was? 2007, so right, it was only 10 years old last year, yeah? Which is why they put the iPhone X out. So um, with the iPhone 1, that had a, um, you know, you could get it in a 4 and an 8 gigabyte, uh, and that was, that was back in, in, in 2007. And then, of course, in 2017, so just another 10 years later, we've got the iPhone X, and with the iPhone X, you know, we've got um, augmented reality, we've got uh, video conferencing, we've got uh, 12 megabit pixel cameras. I, I mean, the technology's really, really moved on. Um, so what the hell does that all mean? What's that? It's carbon. It's a special kind of carbon. It's called graphene. So graphene is one atom thick. So they can make it now. It's one atom thick, uh, 10 times stronger than steel. It's one of the strongest, in fact, it is the strongest um, compound on the planet. Uh, and they, can, they, they can't really manufacture it yet, but they can, they can certainly um, make it in, in small quantities. Uh, it's transparent. It conducts electricity. It's incredibly strong. It's incredibly light. Now, what's really fascinating about graphene is that carbon is the sixth most abundant element in the universe. Yeah? So, um, what I wanted to just highlight there is that technology is deflationary, you know, and it's speeding up. So, we had our first PC in 1983. Back then... I just don't think you could have envisaged how quickly it would have moved to the iPhone X in, in 2017 with augmented reality and all the crap that that's come with. 
Um, and then you've got a whole lot of other things happening. Now, now, carbon is a simple thing. It's just an element that exists in the universe. There's bloody truckloads of the shit out there, right? And, and yet technology applied to carbon can create things that you just couldn't have imagined before. Now, what starts happening when you start building planes out of graphene? I'm not saying, suggesting that we'll do that anytime soon, but what happens when you start to use these compounds that are a hell of a lot stronger than steel, a hell of a lighter, uh, and uh, the sixth most abundant element in the universe? So you can sort of see that a combination of traditional technology, but technology and innovation is, is driving a huge amount of deflation out there. If you think, these are how I do graphs. I don't have those pretty graphs. Um, and this looked heaps better on my, my MacBook. It didn't translate to a PC as well. Um, the stick man was better. He had a smiley face on him. Um, so I've, I've, I've borrowed this from a website called um, Wait But Why. And um, so some of you may have seen this, this graph before. But this is a little dude, right? And he's, he's standing on this timeline. You've got time and you've got change. And of course, he can't see the future. He can only see the past. And the past looks pretty linear. And it doesn't actually look all that surprising. So the little dude, he projects a future that, that looks like a continuing growth of, of, of what he's had in the past. And that's pretty much the way that we all see the world. The interesting thing is that he's actually, yeah, that should have looked cooler, but never mind. Um, he's, actually, he's actually on a bit of a growth path. And if he could see into the future, it might look a little bit scary. Because if you're on a growth curve, and I, and I think we are, I think the changes that are occurring are, are, are happening faster and faster and faster. Um, and you think about the things that are coming, and I've got uh, in my bad handwriting quantum computers, artificial intelligence, networked intelligence. When you think about these things that are coming and you think about um, compounds like graphene and, and what that could do in so many industries, and, and we, could go, we could go through talking about thousands of different examples of technology that are advancing incredibly fast. The future is changing really, really quick. And we just can't really see what's coming. We can't really comprehend it yet. Yet when we get to the future and we look back, it'll all make sense. The only reason I sort of talk about that is... I think we are in, in a bit of an epoch. Now, the thing about an epoch is you don't know it, you're in it until you come out the other side, right? We've gone into this world, things are really starting to change quite rapidly now, and, and what goes into that world and what comes out are going to be two quite different things. And so I'm sitting here and I'm, I'm thinking about this, and this will all make sense in a, in, a, in a couple of minutes. So let's jump ahead a little bit and talk about something a bit different. Now, we were just talking about technology and innovation, and we were talking about it over a reasonably short period of time. So what we've seen in the world is a huge amount of innovation. We've progressed from this agricultural economy to manufacturing to tertiary um, and service industries. And then we've heard this thing about the knowledge economy, right? And people have been lecturing us about it for about a decade now, but yeah. Eh, sounds interesting, but you know, meh. but it's coming, and I think this is the wave, right? Now, if we if we look at this graph here, what this is showing, have I got a pointy thing? Boop, boop. Yeah, yeah, somewhere there, eh? I just don't want to press the wrong thing. Um, no, I won't bother. Um, 1985. So this is around the time of that first PC. Your mortgage interest rates were 20 percent. That's pretty much when uh, interest rates in New Zealand peaked around that sort of time. If we come forward to 1995, uh, interest rates were down to around uh, 10%. So this is uh, pre-2000. Uh, and I think at that stage, Kiwis were starting to think that it was quite a good interest rate. That wasn't too bad, you know, sort of around 9 to 10%. In fact, those of you that are in your 50s would have thought, shit, that's a good rate. Can't get much lower than that. Um, but they did. They kept going down. Uh, and in 2017, you know, we've got rates somewhere between 4 and 5%, depending on whether you're fixing or floating. And at the same time, house prices have gone up. Now, there is a correlation there, and it would be silly to ignore it, right? 
asset prices go up when interest rates go down. Uh, it's a natural correlation. The interesting thing for me is, um, will interest rates go back up? And, and the big argument that I've had against interest rates going up, and I, I, I still very much hold this, this view of the world, is that technology-led deflation uh, is a big driver that's often ignored by mainstream economists in terms of what it's doing uh, in terms of suppressing and holding on prices in particular, right? And you can think of so many examples where technology, whether it's faster, better planes, um, keeping real airfares down, or it's uh, Uber, or all of this new te you know, tech and, and, and marketplaces and stuff that are evolving that are, that are dragging down and holding prices down. Uh, it's just keeping inflation out of the economy. And if we're going to have more and more of this, and if it's going to accelerate and it's going to transform and really start to change the world that we live in, to me, I just can't see that translating through to mainstream inflation. Uh, so I think technology and the speed of change and everything that's coming with that uh, is going to hold real interest rates low for a very long time. This is an abundance mentality. It's, it's kind of like recognizing that, you know, if carbon is the sixth most abundant element in the universe and you can apply technology to it to do just about anything, then there is no scarcity. And if there is no scarcity, there is no inflation. And if there is no inflation, then you're in a world of, 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 of relatively low interest rates. And that doesn't mean interest rates won't go up next year or the year after. They might go up a bit. But for those of you that sit there and dread remembering the days when interest rates were 10 or 20%, I just simply don't think that that's the reality of the world that we live in. Um, the next graph, if I can get it going. Doo -doo -doo. Oh, sorry, it's not showing on my screen. I'll go backwards. Did I jump forward a few? <coughs> oh, yeah, okay. So look, that's, um, yeah, okay, cool. Boom. Oh, oh I missed that. Um, Okay, so, so we, were, we were really talking about that before, just in terms of the technology change that's come through, but just think about it. You know, um, 1985, the first PC, interest rates at 20%, Windows, first iPhone, cloud computing, augmented reality, AI, cryptocurrencies, a blockchain. For a lot of you, you're probably just sitting there thinking, what the hell is blockchain? I know cryptocurrencies have been going through the roof. Are they a crap investment? I'm not even going to have a view on that. Um, but what's, what's more interesting is blockchain. And blockchain is, is really looking about democratizing trust and changing the way that the internet works. Um, you don't have to understand a hell of a lot about it, but it's a, it's a radical shift away from the way that the internet works today where you can trust um, the environment that you're in. These things are happening faster and faster and faster and faster and faster. The other thing that I think is worth overlaying on all of this when we think back to, to house prices um, is just how much debt has grown. So um, a lot of people don't realize this, but in 2000, the total mortgage market in New Zealand was only $61 billion. I say only, it sounds like a big number, right? $61 billion. But the point is, since 2000, the amount of household debt has gone from $61 billion to $246 billion. Yeah? There is an increase of $185 billion. It looked really cool with the graphics. Um, over 18 years. Now, that is one hell of a lot of stimulus that's going into economy. That's money that people are borrowing and spending. Now, sure, they've borrowed it, they've put it into property, property prices have gone up. Somewhere on the other side of that is, is, is someone that's uh, selling a property. Um, no matter which way you look at it, whether it's going into asset prices or going into consumption, that is a creation of a shitload of money. And that's gone into the economy. Now, for me, it's a bit of a creosote moment. And, and as a mortgage broker... Certainly one of the things that, that, that we see is that New Zealanders really can't borrow much more debt. Um, we, we are debted up to our eyeballs. $246 billion is a lot of money to owe. So if we come back to that interest 
rate discussion earlier on, and we're talking about technology-led deflation. The other reason I don't think that interest rates will go up much is they simply can't. We couldn't afford it, right? Interest rates go up to slow down consumption, to slow us down from doing crazy things, right? Um, they don't need to increase interest rates much to do that. I can promise you, you put interest rates up to 6%, and a lot of people will be squealing. So um, interest rates do not need to go up much to have a pretty dramatic impact on our economy, yeah, and in terms of consumption and slowing things down. So we're indebted up to our eyeballs, uh, and we've got a lot of technology changing, which is just removing any form of inflation um, that's out there. So what? That sounds a little bit bleak. So I think, I think the reality is that um, I'm, not, I'm not overly bullish on property at the moment. I haven't been for a, for a wee while, simply because when you get confronted with that much debt and you get confronted with everything else that's going on, uh, it's, hard to be, it's hard to be too bullish on it. But I also think that it's not a homogenous world out there. It's not a homogenous market. And there's things that go, go on beneath the surface that often don't get sort of sucked up. And a couple of things that I think are really interesting lately um, that, that really highlight Auckland in particular, but you could look at different parts of this market and you could find different demographic trends. The two that I like, one is that uh, you would have seen in the paper recently the Auckland market has had $100 billion GDP. Um, Auckland has been growing at an average of 7% cumulative average growth rate for the last five years. That's a bloody good growth rate. If, if you were in an economy that's growing at 7% per year, you'd be like, woo, that's pretty bloody good, right? But we tend to ignore this because, yeah, the country's growing at, I don't know, three, three and a half. Auckland's growing pretty damn strong, and it has been for a while. Um, if you think about the number of tourists that we've got here and how the world's getting smaller and how people are living differently and choosing to do business differently and all of these things that technology is allowing. Um, Auckland is part of a, of, a, of, a, of a world that's getting smaller, but it's a, it's a global city and it's, it's got a, a, a bit to play in that. I, I asked Google, and of course Google's always right, um, before, and just to put it in perspective, um, does anyone know how many millionaires there are in China? Have a guess. Shout me out a number. How many? A million? Yeah, there's 2,378,000 millionaires in China. 2,378,000 millionaires in China. It's a big number, right? And they're not that far away from us. They love buying our milk, and they love coming down here and having photos taken, right? <laughs> It's a big market, and New Zealand's a really small thing. So, you know, a small bit of that. So when you think of all these big trends and everything else, you, you just can't help but think, you know, with this little country and a very big sort of economic world, how many millionaires are there in the U.S.? I know there's a few Americans that want to come live out here now. Yeah? How many millionaires are there in the U.S.? There's 7 million, 135,000 millionaires in the U.S., so just, I, just, I love those numbers because they put a really good global perspective on things. And, and we can get too caught up in what's happening here and, you know, whose cat's died. And, um, now, the other thing that I just wanted to point to, because we, there was a little bit of a theme about technology going on earlier, um, and I, I was really excited about this because I've been trying to figure out, I know that lower interest rates have driven up house prices. I know that people have been borrowing a lot more money and, and combined with the lower interest rates and everything else that's driven up house prices, but it's not that simple, and, and there's more going on here. And I really think that this economic shift towards a knowledge economy has got a, a bit to play in that, and, and maybe Ludo will have some thoughts on that in terms of how people are choosing to live differently now. Um, the, um, but this one here... So there was a study that the government put out last year that I just happened to read. Um, it was on the ICT sector, so information, technology, and, and telecommunications. And it highlighted that ICT is contributing 3.6 billion GDP to the New Zealand economy now, which is a good number. 
Um, it's, it's not stellar in terms of dairy or some of the other industries we've got, but it's a, it's, it's a good number. Um, but what, what really excited me is that the cumulative average growth rate in ICT is running 9% per year for the last five, six, seven years. Um, it's a high growth industry and it's growing fast, but more than that, and I know this because I have to employ IT people in my business, um, is their bloody salaries keep going up. Um, and they've got really high salaries, right? So back when the study was done, the average salary in the industry was $99,000, which is a hell of a lot higher than the averages for the New Zealand economy. So we've got, we've got a part of the market that's growing quite fast um, with, with a lot of young people in it earning very, very good money. And that, and that sort of starts to make a bit more sense to me because whenever we sort of hear the stories about first home buyers and stuff and how difficult it is to buy, and don't get me wrong, it is, and it, and it can be difficult, is that we've always found that we've got these, these clients there that can't afford to buy into this market. Um, and they drive this market, and they drive the inner city, um, the sort of inner city fringe suburbs like uh, Mount Albert, uh, Avondale, I'm picking on some of my favorites, Ponsonby, and then maybe around the other side places like Ellerslie and stuff. Um, I'll throw a little thing out for Mungry Bridge as well. Um, but, you know, um, the, the, the reality is we have got this, this growing class of technology professionals earning really good income um, who, who, who can afford to buy. You know, and the problem is if we just treat the entire market as this homogenous mass with household incomes on average being roughly, you know, $100,000 a year, we miss what's going on underneath the surface and we miss all of these changes that are occurring in the economy. And so that probably just brings me back to the final point around sort of property investing, which is, is it a good time to buy? Is it not a good time to buy? Um, and and, and in, in my world, um, I don't think that's ever a simple question. Um, I can see some really good opportunities at the moment. I can see some clients doing um, some very good deals and buying some good properties. Um, I know that parts of this market are really soft. I know that the market's been really illiquid and that it was very difficult to sell your property in the last quarter of last year um, and that people that desperately need to sell are forced to sell into a market where they're going to take a lower price. Um, I've seen good deals. Um, I've equally seen people trying to buy properties and still ending up in auctions with five or six other people and just not getting the property that they want. So it's, it's a real mixed bag. Um, but there's always going to be opportunities out there. For me, property investing is really about understanding the demographic changes that are occurring, the changes that are occurring to the economy and positioning yourself into that sort of thing long term. So um, we've got questions and answers afterwards, um, and maybe at that point, you know, if you want to talk about anything more technical around what's happening with credit rules and LVR restrictions and stuff, I can cover that then. Thank you very much.